Welcome to Tales from the Rabbit Hole. I'm your host, Mick West. My guest today is Professor Arby Loeb. Uh, Arby, thank you very much for being here. Uh, it's uh, great for you to make the time to do this. Thanks for hosting me. It's my pleasure. So you are a professor of science, and I found that very interesting because uh, science, you know, as you know, is very compartmentalized. And even at school, you start out, you know, we, we start out learning science, and then it very quickly divides into physics, chemistry, and biology. So, uh, and when I looked up professor of science, it doesn't seem to be a very common title. You see things like professor of science communications or professor of science and technology and things like that. How do you get to be a professor of science? Well, it's a name, the chair. So uh, it's called the Frank B. Bird, the junior professor of science at Harvard. And I originally was a professor of astronomy uh, because mm. I belong to the astronomy department, but then uh, they gave me uh, a chair position. So um, that's where the science came in. And of course, uh, the way I view myself is as a broad uh, uh, ranging uh, scientist in the sense that I worked on many different aspects of science. You know, I worked on uh, the first stars in the universe early on. And you might call it the scientific version of the story of Genesis, let there be light. Mm -hmm. And uh, I worked on black holes for many years and uh, also uh, served as the founding director of the Black Hole Initiative at Harvard. Uh, and I worked on, um, uh, uh, most recently, the search for life um, in the universe. And so it's a very diverse range of um, research topics. And, uh, you know, when I started astrophysics, I was given an advice by my mentor at the time, John Bacall. He said, you should focus on a very specific topic um, so that you can become the world expert and i never listened to his advice yeah that's good uh <laughs> i i like the idea of being a scientific generalist myself uh, you know obviously i'm not really a scientist as such but uh, you know I, I like learning lots of different new things and you know i appreciate that uh, and you when we before we started this this interview when we were getting it in touch you advised me to have a look at the the series of articles that you write at scientific america and you know they're, they're great they're really interesting and i think it gives you a very people a very good idea of who you are and uh, the, the broad range of things that you yeah. are interested in, in you know in a way these these essays and also my book extraterrestrial are an admission that uh, of my true love, which was philosophy at a young age mm -hmm. when I grew up on a farm. And uh, I was mostly interested in the big questions. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have answers to those big questions like what's the meaning of life? You know, we are born into this world like actors put on a stage without knowing what the play is about. And most people think the play is about us. And, uh, right. you know, it started with the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle that argued that we are at the center of the universe. And People believed him for a thousand years. It was very flattering to our ego. Um, and uh, what we now know is the universe is 10 to the power 26 times bigger. The observable volume of the universe is 10 to the power 26 times bigger than the size of our body. So we're clearly not at the center of the stage. And moreover, the play has been going on for 13.8 billion years. So it's clearly not about us. Uh, that's, yes. you know, I understand where this is coming from, because my daughters, when they were young, they thought everything is centered on them. And <laughs> then they, they got to, into the world, they went to the kindergarten and realized there are other kids and some of them are smarter than they are. And, you yes. know, we still have to mature in that sense. Uh, many of my colleagues still argue that we are alone and uh, until given extraordinary evidence, they will continue to think that we are the smartest on our cosmic block. <laughs> Yeah, we. Uh, I have that kind of experience myself of thinking I was the smartest kid around when I was very, very young, and I, you know, I, I was in my school, my little school. But then, of course, you go out into the, the broader world and to the universities, yeah, well, and, and you well, suddenly uh, realize. Yeah, well, I, I think it's uh, true for someone like Einstein. You know, he thought that he's the smartest early on, and it was true later on as well. Right. But <laughs> most people <laughs> are not Albert Einstein. And perhaps for you. <laughs> Uh, so you talked about philosophy, and let's let's talk a little bit about the philosophy of science. Uh, and one of the big issues in the philosophy of science is the the demarcation issue. Uh, how do you decide what is science and what is pseudoscience? And we're going to talk here about about UFOs. Right. And obviously, a lot of people would consider uh, the study of UFOs to be pseudoscience. And yeah, you know, I think you uh, the disagree. Uh, yeah, the distinction is rather simple. Um, science is, uh, if I had to define it, actually 
I was asked to define an intelligent civilization. And the way I define an intelligent civilization is a, a civilization guided by the principles of science, which are uh, cooperation and, and sharing of evidence-based knowledge. So there are two elements to that. One is cooperation and sharing. And if you look at human history, it's full of instances where humans try to feel superior relative to each other and did not really share. I mean, even recently, um, you know, the information about COVID-19 was not shared with the rest of the mm -hmm. world when it started in Wuhan, China. And that is not a good uh, sign because uh, intelligence is, you know, trying to promote a better future for then all of all humans. And in that sense, you know, uh, political boundaries and, and boundaries between countries do not make much much sense. You want to help everyone. And nowadays we live in a global world. So that's one of the elements. And then the second one, more, most important, that makes the distinction between pseudoscience and real science is evidence based knowledge. And, you know, we see a lot uh, of, of discussion in politics that is not evidence based and in other realms of, of, of our life. And uh, I think um, we will be much better off if we were to be guided by evidence. And, and by the way, we will talk about the Galileo project, but the entire motivation for me uh, to lead this project is to bring a subject that you might call pseudoscience, because perhaps the evidence that was released to the public was not uh, uh, convincing. And there might be other evidence, you know, it might be like a, an iceberg where we see only the tip. But I don't, you know, I don't really care <laughs> uh, if there is classified evidence and what the past evidence is. I just want to collect enough evidence to examine it scientifically because science is guided by evidence and, and nothing more, nothing less. And, and uh, we should regard science as a learning experience. For me, science is a privilege of maintaining your childhood curiosity. And, you know, as a child, as a kid, when adults tell you something, you don't believe them. You just go out and, and check it for yourself. Something yeah. bad happens to these kids when they become adults, yeah. they stop checking and they start to believe uh, uh, ideas that are not, uh, you know, um, that are not supported by evidence. Yeah, and that's something I'm very much against, obviously, because I'm kind of a skeptic slash debunker. Uh, that's that's and, perfectly yeah. fine to be skeptic. And I think it's important to, to be skeptic because yeah. that, if, if that motivates you to collect better evidence, uh, you are following science. Yeah, so l let's say, uh, just imagine for a second, I was, uh, I got a check for a, a million dollars here and I want to invest this million dollars in the the search for UFOs, like, because I'm personally convinced to say that UFOs might be alien visitors and I want to kind of you know, get that out to the world. Why should I give my million dollars to you and Project Galileo? Okay, so uh, the Galileo project is basically the, uh, the scope of it is trying to establish the study of, of unidentified objects uh, whose nature is not known in our atmosphere, um, to study it scientifically, meaning, to collect evidence uh, using instruments that we have full control over. So, for example, past uh, testimonies, uh, you know, do not stand up to the scrutiny of science. You can't write a scientific paper based on what people tell you. You can't say this person said that and, and submit the paper for publication. That's not acceptable. Uh, what you need is to rely on instruments that collect the quantitative evidence. Um, and so that's point number one. The second is, the instruments that were used in the past uh, on reports uh, on uh, unidentified objects uh, were not optimized for that purpose. There were, for example, a jittery camera in the cockpit of a fighter jet. I mean, that's not uh, a scientific experiment because you don't know exactly how the fighter jet uh, maneuvered and uh, you don't know what kind of jitters were introduced to the camera during that flight. And um, what you want is to have full control and full knowledge of your experimental setup. And that's what the Galileo project wants to do. We want to, we don't want to look back at past evidence. In fact, we say that explicitly on our website. Also, the other thing that I should say, we don't want to entertain explanations that deviate from the known laws of physics. So if someone says, oh, actually, you know, there is something really strange going on that violates the standard model of, of physics, we will not entertain that. We will use our knowledge, uh, just like in a regular scientific experiment. Of course, if we are pushed to the point where the evidence is so 
uh, unusual that uh, you can say for sure that um, our understanding of physics is violated, you know, that would be uh, worth uh, a Nobel Prize, of course. And, and I find it unlikely because there are so many experiments that we've tested the current understanding mm -hmm. of the laws of physics that I would really find it surprising if these objects violate. So at first we will uh, use the what we know about physics, the laws of nature, and uh, not deviate from that, and then collect as much data as possible using a, a, a telescopes uh, connected to uh, cameras that feed the data into computer systems that filter it for objects of interest. And I should say, I mean, people would ask, okay, what's new about it? You know, we have telescopes operated by astronomers uh, looking at the sky all the time. Well, the answer is if a bird flies above a telescope that astronomers are using, they just ignore it. We will look at it and see that it's a bird and identify mm -hmm. it. We will try to get a high resolution image. Just to give you a sense, an object the size of a person uh, at a distance of a mile uh, can be resolved uh, with a megapixel image so that you can see the size of the head of a pin on it using a one meter telescope and uh, just standard optics. And then, um, you know, in uh, a few weeks ago, I looked online and you can actually purchase such a telescope. Uh, you just add it to your bag. There is a button, add to the bag. It costs half a million dollars. That's a lot of money. But apparently there are people willing to spend that. So the point is with a big enough telescope, you can tell whether an object the size of a person has a label saying made in China, made in Russia, or made on exoplanet X, you know? And uh, yeah. that's what we will... Now, I should tell you that I'm not interested at all in anything that is human made. You know, if it says made in China or made in uh, Russia, you know, that's very boring as far as I'm concerned. I will transfer all the information to Washington DC, whoever wants it. Uh, I don't, you know, the, the project is not about that. We don't care about that in, uh, kind of objects. Uh, the, two, the two types that are of interest are of course, atmospheric phenomena, you know, things that happen in nature were unexpected and produce interesting events that were previously unappreciated, you know, that, that's why their nature is not known in the UAP report to, to, to Congress. So that's one possibility. And of course, there is a possibility that something out of this earth came uh, nearby. So, I mean, we are completely agnostic uh, without any agenda, just trying to collect the data. And, and the good okay. thing is, you know, that we are funded by donations. So I did not fundraise. I just got not one million, but two million, nearly two million dollars over the past few weeks from donors that I've never met before until the last okay. uh, uh, few mm. weeks. And, and they just decided to support that research. And uh, I said at that point, I said, okay, well, I can assemble uh, exceptional scientists, uh, mostly astronomers that know how to construct telescopes that will serve the purpose that we need them for. Uh, and you might ask, why not uh, use satellite data? You know, the, there was some satellite data looking down. Well, satellites move around the Earth uh, very quickly. They can't really monitor the motion of a given object in the way that we want it. And uh, so I was asked by many people, why not use existing data? The point is, existing data was never designed for the purpose that we are talking about. This is really a new endeavor. A new, and, and the reason it was not done in the past is very simple. Sci the science community, scientists, ridiculed this subject and didn't take it seriously. At the same time, there were people out there uh, making statements that do not make much sense, including statements about violating the laws of physics, you know. And, uh, and then the scientists said, you see, th there is no point in us getting engaged because it makes no sense. So the two communities basically created the status quo where not much was done. And then when the report came to Congress, at that point, it looked to me as if, it's, you know, it's very intriguing for us to look into it because former CIA directors Brennan and Woolsey would say this is a serious matter. Former President Barack Obama said this is a serious matter. These are real objects. So if the politicians in Washington, D.C., you know, and, and military personnel say they don't understand the nature of some objects that appear to be real. At that point in time, I say, let's move this subject away from the talking points of politicians, military personnel to the realm of science so that we can clear up the fog and resolve it once and for all. You know, this is a subject, we are not in the dark ages, right? So we, there, there is, we shouldn't uh, uh, speculate. We, we can clear it up 
with the investment of a few tens of millions of dollars, and we can talk about why I need more money in order to do it properly. But the point is we can clear up this, this fog and, and find the answer and then move on. You know, if it ends up being a natural phenomenon, <laughs> so be it. I have no agenda. That's a very interesting idea, the, the idea that you can clear it up in just, uh, I guess, a few years with a few tens of millions of dollars. Uh, and that, yeah. that would be great, obviously, if that actually happened. But let's kind of like look at the nitty gritty there. Yeah. You're proposing essentially a network of, of telescopes that are going to right. uh, get high resolution images of objects in the sky. And you talked about one telescope. It's a half million tele telescope. Oh, no, no. I looked at it. So I gave an example of one telescope, a meter right. size, but it's, we, we are likely to use small, uh, slightly smaller telescope because the cost is still an issue if, if, yeah. you know, if currently we have- It's run out very quickly. Million, yeah. So, you know, the, the obvious issue with uh, UFOs is that the sky is very, very large. You know, the, 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 and the amount right. of area that you have to cover is very, very large. And we, right. we see UFOs because we have lots of people. And so people looking up in the sky see things right. and uh, we have a, a very, very broad net. Right. How are you going to get sufficient coverage to get sufficient frequency of observations? Yeah, uh, well, that's, uh, that's an excellent uh, question. And we made some preliminary estimates for how many telescope systems we might need, given you know, the, the uh, area that is covered by each telescope system. Okay? And, and the answer is, you know, for given the reports by uh, military personnel, you would need of order at least a hundred stations, a hundred telescope systems, um, and uh, as to so they were the much, entire United States. Well, it could be the U.S. It could be elsewhere. You know, uh, of course, the best sites in terms of visibility are mountain tops. That's why astronomers put telescopes on mountain tops, and because the atmosphere is more dilute as you go up, and uh, there is less blurring by atmospheric turbulence, so you can see better to greater distances without. Mm -hmm. Uh, deterioration of the image quality and uh, but it may well be I mean some people claim that UAP concentrate around the particular locations like uh, military facilities or, or nuclear reactors and uh, the point is these are the facilities that are most monitored so it's not clear to me that it's not uh, just a selection yeah. bias, but um, at any event, um, and, and obviously, you know, most of the sky is not classified. That's why astronomers use telescopes without any problem. Uh, and so, we may not uh, approach military facilities because uh, some, you know, these areas are restricted. But but we will try to spread the telescopes over a wide range of of um, environments and. Uh, the question of the location is uh, yet to be decided. Where would we put them? But what I'm saying is uh, currently with the current funding, we can at most fund uh, up to 10 uh, systems. Right. Uh, and uh, the thing is we need 100 or, or more. Yes. So we need 10 yeah. times more funding. Uh, current, so we need tens of millions. But, but if we have that, we, if, we, if we will have that, which... I'm optimistic about because once we demonstrate that we can we can achieve the, the data quality that we need, uh, at that point we might get more donors to to, to support the project. And you know, I, I must emphasize we are not taking away money from such as you know the the, the mainstream science done by the National Science Foundation or, or NASA in the sense, you know, people are still searching for the dark matter, for example, right? But right, right, that's supported so. by DOE or supported by uh, NSF. And um, we haven't found the dark matter for four decades. We've been searching, investing hundreds of millions of dollars in the dark, so to speak. <laughs> and that is mainstream in science. Yeah. That's mainstream yeah. in uh, astronomy and it's completely legitimate not to find something you're looking for you know and uh, uh, like people were searching for weakly interacting massive particles i don't regard it as a failure that for 40 years nothing was found and just upper limits were set and i asked yeah. an experimentalist how long will you continue to search and he said as long as i'm getting funded so <laughs> that is completely but having zero or a thousand times less funding for the trying to figure out the nature of this UAP doesn't make much sense to me. So I think uh, at this day and age, you know, science should engage in a topic that is of such interest to the public and clear it up. You know, we are not, yeah. uh, you know, a thousand years ago, there were people saying the human body has a soul and therefore anatomy should be forbidden. Imagine if scientists would say, Oh, some people are saying nonsense about the human body. We don't want to engage 
with the human body. We don't want to have operations because there is all this nonsense said about it. Uh, you know, it's a controversial subject, the human body. Think where, where would modern medicine be? The point is, if science has the ability to address a question that has a lot of nonsense being said about it, it should do it so that agree, the nonsense will I... stop being said about it so that we can clear it up and move on. Yeah, I would. I very much like that. I, I would like to have more data. I, 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 you know, I'm a big fan of science and science fiction, and uh, the idea of, of alien contact would be would be great, or even just evidence of of a, a past alien civilization even would be very good. So I am in favor of this. But you know, what I'm interested in is is it kind of is it the right thing to do? Uh, and you, know, you talk about these 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 telescopes and you know the, the smaller ones. You're going to have these say you know ten to a hundred uh, stations, and they're going to be taking photographs of things. Uh, but you know, is is photography really going to be showing you that much? Because a lot of the time, what you see is is images that are ambiguous. You see that now, and what you're trying to do, obviously, is to get an image that is less ambiguous. But you know, is that is that really the so, best so the use size, of, of uh, money? Yeah, to get um, a better resolution image, all you need is a bigger aperture. So when people use, for example, cell phones, the images are always blurry for an object at a distance of a mile because the aperture of the camera is so small. But if you make a camera that is 100 times bigger, then you can get 100 times better angular resolution. So it's just about that optics. But moreover, in a given station, in a given system, it will not be just one telescope. It will be multiple, like, for example, two or three, so that you can get a parallax. You can see how the object moves in three dimensions on the sky. You can get a trajectory. You will get a better image of it because the telescopes are bigger than previously used. And moreover, we'll use uh, detectors not just in optical light, reflected sunlight, but also in infrared light and the radar systems in the radio. So, um, and we will have full control over the instruments that we are using. So we, we will know exactly what is happening. And I should emphasize one of the most important aspects of our, our work would be that it, it's open data. Anyone will be able to access it. There will be okay, no mystery about uh, hidden data or whether uh, high resolution data exists but not released because it will not be classified. The only reason the data by the government is classified because it, it was taken by classified sensors and um, the government doesn't uh, release the data simply because it doesn't want to reveal the quality of the sensors being used to monitor our sky so that adversaries will know what we use. And uh, we don't have that problem. And by the way, I personally do not want to look at any classified data because that would limit my freedom as a scientist. I don't want to be obligated uh, not to think uh, because it will always be in the back of my head if I had witnessed the classified data. And uh, if, if I don't see it, then we can just collect our own new data and examine it uh, with a fresh perspective. I have nothing against other scientists looking at classified data that we find, but I want to be free to look at new data. And uh, you know, the sky is not classified. Most of it is not classified. So we can just look up that the astronomers are using it, uh, are looking at the sky all the time. The difference is that we will focus on nearby objects. I should say the Galileo project has two components. The, there is a second component that has to do with interstellar objects, objects that came from outside the solar system and enter the solar system, like Oumuamua, for example, mm -hmm. that look weird. Objects that do not match what we are used to in terms of looking at comets or asteroids. And we just want to figure out their nature. You know, just like you walk on the, on the beach and you see most of the time rocks and every now and then you see a plastic bottle. So we want to look if there is any plastic bottle out there that enters the solar system, just to make sure yeah. that, you know, that we understand the, what is coming in. And I should say, even if we find something uh, like a, a hydrogen iceberg, like some people suggested for Oumuamua to explain its weird properties, you know, that's something we've never seen before, something that was not produced in the solar system. We know that. And, you know, it's, it should be very abundant because Oumuamua was the first interstellar object that we discovered. So if we understand objects like Oumuamua to be hydrogen icebergs based on future evidence, that will be important for science because it will yeah. imply that there are nurseries that make objects we haven't expected that are very common and we will learn something new. So my point is with new evidence, you always learn. It's always beneficial to collect evidence. We are not 
using money that was otherwise intended for another purpose. We are getting donations. And so yeah, I, should, I'm, I would think I'm that for it. this project should get the blessings of all scientists, which it yeah. doesn't. <laughs> well, no, it, it doesn't, I think, but because of the association that it has with the, the UFOs. But like getting into that, I think uh, you know, if you're going to go out on a scientific expedition, you're trying to gather some data to try to answer some questions, don't you have to have some kind of existing data set uh, that kind of justifies what you're going to do? So like we've, we've got all these existing observations that people have had and we have a few videos and things like that. Uh, do you do you think there's a, a sufficient data sets to justify what what you're doing in terms of the the, the telescope installations and what what would you say is the justification for this particular experiment yeah. that you are doing so interesting the justification for me was the fact that the um odni the, the uap report to congress um uh, had a classified component i didn't see mm. any of that data but it was presented to the White House. It was presented to many officials in past administrations. And when CIA directors Brennan and Woolsey and when former President Barack Obama say that it's a serious matter, that they saw the classified component and it looks convincing, what I infer from that, and these are serious people, you see, that I trust. What I infer from that is that there is a mountain of data that we don't have access to where the images are much crispier than we see. Okay, the public sees. Mm -hmm. Now, I haven't seen that data, but that's what I infer. Because, you know, the, if these people saw the same fuzzy images that the two of us saw, then forget about it. It's not convincing. But the fact, the way that they spoke about the subject, and include, that includes also Bill Nelson, you know, the director of the, the NASA administrator, yeah. uh, uh, who expressed uh, his wish that scientists would look into the data. And then, you know, I, I say these people saw the classified component, at least part of it, and they talk about it seriously. So that's sufficient. That's a sufficient threshold for me to say scientists should collect new data uh, so that it's not classified, op open data, and analyze it in a transparent way so that we get a clear understanding of this, of this UAP phenomenon. And, and, uh, and and move on after that. If if it happens to yeah. be a natural phenomena, I have not no quarrel with it. You know, whatever the data reveals, we will uh, show to the public. And uh, now, one thing to keep in mind is uh, it's a mixed bag. It's probably a mixed bag, right? Uh, I mean, there were lots of uh, reports in the past. Most of them probably have some mundane explanation, as you uh, argued on many occasions. Uh, and that would be completely fine. It's, the point is, we need to show that all of them, at least those that we can detect, uh, have mundane explanations. And, 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 and some of them may be exotic explanations, you know, like rare phenomena in air, in the atmosphere. That would be fine with me. But even if there is one object that is of extraterrestrial origin, you know, that would be major news, right? So uh, what we want is to have a high enough quality of data on one uh, that looks really unusual. And I don't care if 99.9% .9 of all the objects we find uh, appear to be made by humans or in the atmosphere and so forth. If we do find one that seems to be uh, clearly not human made and clearly not natural, within the atmosphere of the earth that would be of a, a, a very interesting yeah, you uh, only need so that, one. that that would motivate me to continue the search you see yeah yeah so, but the, the the this kind of like data set essentially the uap report uh, that you're using as this uh, uh, an impetus for the project it's, it's kind of vague and it doesn't really give any specifics there's no specific cases listed there's no right. locations and no right. no numbers or anything like right. that right. uh so it really it's all it's just giving you a kind of like a very broad thing we think there are we, we, see, we see things in the air that we yeah we i agree identify. with you i agree with you and 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 the un, the reason for that is presumably that the more interesting data is classified and um, you ask yourself why would uh the intelligence agencies yeah. admit that they're not doing their job because if you if you just think about this report they're saying you know we are getting paid to do something and we are not doing it they are telling Congress, you know, we are not doing our job. That's a, an unusual admission, right? That there are objects in the sky that they cannot figure out. 
Oh, it's and the limits me, of their uh, their abilities. I wouldn't say it's not doing their job. Is they they admit there are things that their current capabilities can't uh, right, can't but, actually resolve. But that's resolve. their job, right? They, in terms of national sure. security, their but job is to identify. You're all also the yeah. you're also saying that you think that they have crisp photographs. Uh, you think well, they essentially so would... have what you are trying to get. No, so I would say that they would not come out with an admission that they cannot figure out the nature of these. Uh, objects unless the much better data that they have in their possession, which is not mm. a release to the public, indicated that they should make such a statement. Now, I don't know how good mm. the quality of that data is because I haven't seen it and I'm not interested in seeing it. I'm just saying, given that the, the most conservative organization uh, that we have, which is the government, comes out with a statement like that, given that you know, academia, which is a blue sky <laughs> organization, right? It's, it's supposed to be entertaining all possibilities, open, be open-minded. Given that the most conservative organization tells you there is something we don't understand, academia should respond and say, okay, we'll figure it out for you. Here we are to serve the nation, trying to figure out something that the government doesn't figure out. And to me, it's an interesting puzzle. You know, you, you might on weekends solve a crossword puzzles, you know, and I wouldn't have, I, I would have nothing against that. So in much the same way, there is a puzzle here. We, there is a challenge that the government poses. And uh, me, you know, I as a scientist, am intrigued by it, and I want to resolve it. And I, I'm not using funds that were otherwise used for something else. I'm just saying, let's figure it out. It's, it's fun. You know, science is fun, and science is exciting. So why damp uh, any investigation into the origin of a phenomena the government admits it doesn't understand. Yeah, yeah, and, and I like the idea of uh, solving puzzles, and that's kind of what I do when I look at a UFO video. I am trying to just basically figure out what actually is is going on. Yeah. Um, so the the technology that you're going to use is you know telescopes and radar and things like that. And for me, uh, I, I obviously I would like to get a photograph. So real quick question, like, are you going to have, will, will these telescopes just be taking photographs or are they oh, going no, to be no. recording I mean, video? It's a, stream, it's a stream of photographs. So it's a okay. video, basically, a video of the sky. Now the frame rate is to be decided. We want a high enough frame rate so that we can reconstruct the trajectory of an object, you know, so that we can tell if it's a bird, a drone or a plane or whatever. Um, so we want to be able to tell what the object is doing in real time and get an image of it if possible and then get the, its infrared signature, its radio signature, and possibly some uh, sense of, of its spectrum if we have enough photons, if we have enough light collected. So how, how is the installation know where to point the telescope? How is it going to lock on to an object? Right. So we are still discussing it within the collaboration. You know, we just started the collaboration a, a few weeks ago, and we have a very lively discussion on the optimal instruments to be used mm -hmm. and how to put them together. Uh, but the idea would be to have a telescope system that monitors as bigger as most of the sky, let's put it, above the site where it's located. Uh, and uh, doing it uh, continuously, and then uh, the light is uh, focused to a camera that takes a video of the sky, you know, with some frame rate. And it's a huge amount of data you have to understand. And yeah. it, we cannot store that. So there will be a, a very crucial component is of course the software that will be used to filter out. Most of the time you don't see anything interesting. And But every now and then there will be an object uh, moving and uh, that will be a target of interest. And of course, uh, once we train the system, if it's an AI system or machine learning, whatever computer algorithm, uh, there will be objects that keep repeating like birds, you know, they behave in some special way, their image has a special characteristic and uh, we'll just reject things that look like a bird. And uh, we are not interested in, in, in drones or, or in airplanes either, you know, and. Uh, so it will take time to train the system so that we reject those things. And we will look at everything else that is moving and doing things that are unusual and try to figure it out. And of course, as you said, the key is to cover a large enough chunk of the sky around the earth so that we have an event rate that matches the rate that was reported uh, by pilots. Now, I should say we might have a much larger event rate because 
we are using instruments that are far better than the eyes of pilots, that are sure. far better than the instruments on the, in the cockpit of, of a pilot or in the Navy or where, wherever these uh, reports came from. Uh, and as a result, we'll see smaller objects at greater distances. And that would increase potentially the event rate, but we hope to get much better quality data and therefore a, a much better assessment that you know, will imply what these objects are. So it sounds like from the uh, you know, the filtering aspect of it, uh, you wouldn't want to filter out, say, an aircraft just on the, the fact that it's a shiny metal cylinder in the sky, because that could be an alien spaceship of some sort. So you, you would be doing the filtering there, uh, perhaps more on the motion of the object. Would you be looking well, for unusual motions? No, I mean, if, if you get a high enough resolution of an airplane, it will be clear. Okay, but so you'd be doing just a visual in, visual yeah. elimination. I mean, so, we pretty much know which airplanes are being used by humans, right? So um, yeah, you can we, filter yeah. most of them out just by the ADSB data, and you can just uh, yeah, see yeah, what's up that's, there already. Uh, that's part of it. Yeah, we, yeah. we you know the software, as as you are alluding to, is is extremely important because you don't want to throw the baby with the bathtub. I mean, if you have if you are too selective, you will throw the baby with the bathtub water, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. So you, yeah. So the, the the filtering that you're going to be doing, then, are you saying it will be mostly a visual filter? Or uh, are you looking for specific movement patterns? Well, it will be move. Well, it will be the image, the movement, and of course, if we have multiple detectors, you know, if we have uh, different wavelengths that we are looking at, um, the signature in those different wavelengths will help us. And if we have multiple telescopes, of course, it helps a lot because you can reconstruct the motion in three dimensions. You can uh, have redundancy. That's very important because if one instrument just happens to give you fal fal a false alarm because something, you know, there is a malfunction in that instrument, then you will have uh, others to, to check it. And uh, so that's important to have redundancy. Yeah. So you talk about uh, recreating the, the motion in three dimensions, which I think is very important because if you're going to distinguish things based on the path and the motion, you know, having a 3D, uh, a 3D right. recreation of that is very important. But can you actually now, do that with uh, two telescopes in one location? Oh, yeah, because, um, I mean, you can calculate the angular resolution you need to see a parallax. And, we, you know, it's, it's relatively easy to put telescopes at a reasonable, even at a, a few meters separation, they can get a very significant parallax relative to their angular resolution. And the other thing I should mention is, if, if you assume the, the standard laws of physics apply, right, and you mm -hmm. see an object moving faster than the speed of sound, then it should definitely make sound. It, it should make a sonic boom or something. Uh, and uh, if it goes through water, it should uh, make a splash, right? So uh, the point is, these... I mean, I'm very curious to see that these effects are indeed noticed because that would imply the object is real and you could constrain the parameters of the object. So we will have also audio sensors trying to figure out, you know, indeed, uh, whether if we see an object moving faster than sound, it makes the noise that you expect from a sonic boom. Uh, and all of these things sh should be put together. I mean, according to the what we know about physics, it makes no sense to imagine an object with some cross-sectional area moving through air and not making any sound. Sure, yeah, yeah. Uh, now, just digging a little bit into this this whole uh, issue of, of locating things with with parallax, uh, it seems like you know, if, even if you've got a, a few you know, 10 meter separation on two telescopes and you've got something, say, 10 kilometers away, uh, the amount of uh, accuracy you would need would be quite significant. Now, the one big telescope you mentioned, the the Five hundred thousand dollar one could certainly do it because it's like you know super accurate and calibrated and fast moving, but with the smaller telescopes, would you be able to actually do that? Do they have sufficient resolution in the you know their go to mounts that they have uh, to actually do that within whatever is required, like one arc second or whatever? Yeah, it depends on the size of the telescope, as you say, and indeed the ten meters divided by ten kilometers is roughly two arc seconds, uh, right. and. Uh, you know, uh, so for that, you need the, a bigger um, aperture. You need, the, you know, something of the order of um, at least uh, 10 centimeters. You know, that gives you, if, if you take a wavelength of light that is half a micron, you know, that then uh, something that is of the order of 10 centimeters or more uh, can give you the angular resolution that you need. Uh, of yeah, better I guess than it's, 
yeah. obviously something that uh, <laughs> should be just simple engineering, I guess. You know, figuring out you yeah. know what what the actual resolution of such yeah, a and we we be. went through the numbers and and it works yeah. out. You know, we have exceptional uh, instrumentalists like uh, Nick Lowe and uh, Gaspar Bacos, which who are uh, leading our um, telescope design and. Uh, you know, these are really the top people in the field uh, of astronomy doing these things. And uh, I was very happy to be able to recruit them to the team. So let's, let's talk a little bit about like some different approaches that might kind of mesh with this. Uh, like suppose you're using uh, full sky cameras that take a picture of the entire sky. You mean like fish Could eye? you? Something. Yeah, essentially, yes. Yeah. Uh, or, or multiple cameras in uh, different segments of the sky. So you're just getting full coverage of the sky and you, you can you can see things in the sky. Uh, could you use that with multiple from each station so you could triangulate the position? Yeah, uh, we are discussing that, except um, it, it, again, it's a question of cost and how many can you use? And yeah, but definitely that's something we, we actually have been discussing last week. Uh, okay. So what you're saying makes a lot of sense. And um, the que okay, so the issue is really how big of a telescope uh, do we need? Uh, or if you have uh, multiple telescopes, you know, uh, how to optimize the number versus size and uh, given the cost. And uh, I should say that, um, uh, you know, the distance to which you can resolve objects depends on the size of your aperture, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, and now you have to assume whether the number of objects scales as distance cubed or as distance squared, because if, if the objects are just hovering above the earth surface, okay. then it's two dimensional distribution. When you look towards the horizon, the number of objects that you see as, as a function of distance would scale like distance, the maximum distance squared. But if they are distributed at all elevations in three dimensions, then it will go like distance cubed. And, yeah, yeah. and of course, then you have to decide, is it beneficial to have one big telescope? Because then you can see much farther out uh, and you gain by the size of the aperture cubed, basically, in terms of the volume that you're covering versus um, a situation where you have a lot of small telescopes, each of which is cheaper, but then each of them is able to resolve only a smaller volume. And, um, you know, so we are going through these calculations. Yeah, well, most of the reports that we get are things that happen in the troposphere, essentially, like below, like say 28, 30,000 feet. Well, but that uh, may be just because we were surveying those uh, yeah. regions with, uh, you know, uh, uh, airplanes. Uh, yeah. We, we don't really know. And, and the other thing I should mention, there is another critical element, which is the distribution of objects as a function of size. You see, um, it may well be that the reports uh, focused on uh, some size because that's the size that was noticeable with either the pilot's eyes or, or instruments they were using. And, and I'm really curious to know what, what is the size distribution because you, you can have many more objects that are smaller in size that you can only resolve with, with big telescopes. And um, so the number of UAP that you find will depend on the size distribution, which is un completely unknown. And right. of course, on the instruments that you are using. And uh, if I had an infinite budget, if unlimited budget, <laughs> I would use the, the uh, biggest telescopes we can buy off the shelf, like one meter, let's say, or, or, or so and then just get as many as possible, thousands of them uh, or more, and basically uh, cover the sky and, and just yeah, monitor you can it. Picture and, it, can't you? They'd yeah, like, exactly. Zip, zip, zip going everywhere looking it. at these. Yeah, yeah we just that, need that, enough that funding. You... you can buy all these instruments off the shelf, and it's just sure. a matter of putting them together for the, the purpose. And, and, and I should say some astronomers said, oh, well, we, we have telescopes around the globe. You know, we have... Um, satellites looking down. The point is, all of these instruments that are currently being used are not doing the, the, the job that we want them to do because that. Well, was, so yeah. one instrument that might be doing it is, um, you yeah, know, the, the space fence, uh, which is essentially what the US uses for tracking space debris and space junk. And you talked about things that are very, very small. Uh, and, you know, the space fence, and there's an older version of that as well, use this uh, this multi-static radar, 
where essentially it's just it's listening for reflections of uh, radar pings of of objects in in yeah, but space. they can't resolve it. Multiple... They cannot resolve it probably, right? They cannot tell. Uh, they cannot make an image of the object. They cannot take an image, but they can they can track it and they can track right. objects that are as small as I think uh, ten centimeters or bas- basketball okay. size. I so, think. but was, but was the, the, the problem with that it would be just like those fuzzy images. You know, we will know about an object moving in some. So you're right. We will be able to uh, infer the trajectory, right? And yeah, but, but I think the, the trajectory. The interesting thing about a lot of these these things is, in fact, the trajectory, and it's it's often not so much what it looks like, which is often you know just just a, sometimes a sphere or something like that. But if it has an interesting trajectory, like it is actually hovering in space, for example, or if it's moving and changing directions in a certain way, this is something that has been reported, and it would seem like you know an effort at gathering data on things that do that would be important. But it would also seem that. If there were these things flying around in the atmosphere, then uh, the technology like this, this, this space fence, the, uh, the multi-static radar installation of the U.S. government right. would do it. But you know, that's government. But, but you know, that's there's a possibility government. I don't, of, yeah. I don't want but that. The, I, I, uh, I, want, yeah. I know you, you've been approached by people who've, who've, who've talked to you about uh, Peter Davenport in, back in 2004. Um, proposed a UFO hunting uh, method using multi-static radar, which uses FM radio transmitters and then a bunch of uh, receiving stations yeah. to, to track objects in much the same way that the US space right. um, No, space I mean, uh, ra- ra- you're right that radars are very effective at doing that. And I, I will mention an anecdote um, that you may not, not know about. Um, so uh, after Oumuamua was discovered, uh, um, I noticed that there is a, a table, you know, a, a website where they list uh, meteors from the past that were detected by U.S. government sensors, and they, right. they list the numbers about those, I mean, the velocity components of those meteors without giving error bars. And I asked my student mm-hmm. uh, Amir Siraj to look into that, that table and see if there is any object moving faster than you expect for meteors originating from the solar system. So if there is any object that could have originated from outside the solar system in the meteor data that was publicly available. And he found in 2015, there was a meteor that moved much faster uh, than uh, expected for an object bound to the solar system. And we wrote a paper about it and said, uh, here is an example for a meteor that could have been interstellar in origin. And by the way, it was reported in 2015. So it predated Oumuamua. And we wrote a scientific paper, submitted it to the Astrophysical Journal letter, uh, Letters, and um, it was refereed. And then the referee came back and said, um, we don't believe the government. There is no error bar on this measurement. Therefore, this paper should not be published. Mm. And so I said, OK, um, I know some people. You know, I, I chaired the board on physics and astronomy of the National Academies, and there was a member of the committee that uh operate you know works in los alamos and you know behind the the fence so to speak and i asked uh, him whether it's possible to get any uh, limit upper limit on the error budget so that we can quote it and say you know the error is less than something and therefore this object must be from outside the solar system so after many months he came back and uh, provided the needed uh, statement so we put it in the scientific paper and then the referee said oh, that's not good enough. Uh, How do I know that I should trust uh, this person that gave you that information? We want uh, to see the data before we accept this paper for publication. So so then the editor came up with a creative solution. He said, uh, let me find a referee that has uh, clearance to look at the actual data that was obtained by the government and tell us whether the data is reliable. And he couldn't find such a referee. So the paper was left in limbo. Uh, and uh, it's really unfortunate because, um, you know, we are talking about a purely scientific motivation for getting the error budget on a measurement from 2015. And of course, the government has an issue because it will say something about the sensors were, that were used. That's why, you know, from this experience, uh, I learned that it's best to collect your own data. I don't right. want to look at any data because there are layers and layers of bureaucracy that sure. prevent us from having access to government-owned data. 
But I guess that's the idea there with the, the multi-static radar thing is that you wouldn't use any government data. You would be able to set up a relatively cheap network of yeah. uh, receiving stations that could cover yeah, the entire country yeah. and measure, measure trajectories. Uh, yeah. And I think that, that would be a, a great That would be great, addition. except it couldn't give us an image. So for the yeah, trajectories, yeah. you're yeah, exactly right. <laughs> but I, again, like I must say, like I think perhaps this uh, the search for an image is, I, I feel perhaps a little bit misplaced the focus on just searching for an image because really what you want to demonstrate is that there is something unusual. Now, sure, if you get an image of something that looks really weird, that would be great. But you've also got to demonstrate really that it's, it's moving in an unusual way. It could of be course, just a balloon know, or something like that. We can like do that. both. If we have an image and we see the trajectory in 3D with parallax, we can get both. Mm -hmm. and I should say, you know, there is this saying, a yeah. picture is worth a thousand words. In my case, I should tell you that a picture is worth 66,000 words, the number of words in my book, Exoterrestrial. Yes. I wouldn't need to write the book whatsoever if I had a nice photograph that I could show. Uh you, you list three things in the, uh, the Avenue user research for the Galileo project, and one of them was uh, search for satellites. And you, you didn't mention that earlier. You just mentioned the first two. Is this, are, you, are you still doing that, or is that uh, uh, we, a burn it? Um, yeah, that's obviously something of interest, but that would come uh, third. So uh, okay. we will do in parallel the first two investigations, uh, basically searching for you, I mean, identifying UAP, identifying the unidentified. That's the, yes. the goal of the first component. And then uh, uh, trying to find the additional Oumuamua-like uh, objects, either in uh, upcoming data from PANSTARS or from the Vera Rubin Observatory in a couple of years, and then uh, planning on a space mission that will send a, a spacecraft with a, a camera that will come close to these objects. If we, we are catching them early enough, we can intercept their trajectory, just like OSIRIS-REx, uh, came close to uh, the asteroid Bennu and actually landed on it and will bring back a sample in 2023. So in much the same way, you can easily tell the difference between a rock and an artificial object. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I, I'm, like I say, I'm very much in favor of, um, of more data. I just, you know, I'm, I want to focus on getting the, the right data. And obviously that's something that you all have, have talked I think about. We, we, uh, we, agree on, we agree on the fact that the existing data that was released to the public was not of high enough quality. Yeah. Uh, what we don't know is whether other data is more convincing. We don't know that because we haven't seen it. What I'm Classified. saying is, let's try to get that data. <laughs> yeah, if, uh, for the public. But yeah, if it's classified, oh, how are you going to, I'm not saying how are you going to get it, but wouldn't the government not want you to get this data if it's something that they would classify? Or do you think it's classified for kind of no, no, no. I think, reasons? I think, okay. I, I don't believe the government has any agenda. I think the issue is really that the data was collected by sensors okay. whose nature is classified because we don't want adversaries, other nations, to know exactly what technologies we are using to monitor our sky. And because the sensors are classified, the data is also classified. That was my experience with the meteor, the, right? The, a meteor is a completely innocent uh, event that has nothing to do yeah. with uh, other nations. And nevertheless the government had difficulties releasing the error budget. And the reason is because it will say something about the sensors that were used. And uh, that, you know, the lesson I learned from that is the data may not be classified because of its nature, but more, more because of, it was, of, the, of the instruments that were used to collect it. And I'm saying, let's get off the shelf instruments that we have full control over, and then the data will be open. Yeah, that would be great. I would love it. So... You do a lot of these interviews. I could, I could tell you could pretty much interview yourself because uh, you anticipate the well, questions. Uh, over the past six months since my book appeared, I had uh, more than yeah. a thousand interviews, probably 1,100 by now. What do you think uh, about the issue of uh, science popularity and having to popularize science and you know, having to get your message out there as opposed to simply doing the science? I mean, do you feel like you have to do all this, this PR work or is it something that yeah, you, you just want to do or, or what? Okay, so in this context, um, you know, uh, back in February, uh, my publicist in the UK said, uh, good job, Avi, you are selling the book uh, quite well. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, look, I'm not trying to sell the book. I'm trying to convey a message, which I think is quite important. 
And uh, if the public would not care much about my message, I would still deliver it. And if the book didn't sell, I wouldn't care less about it. Uh, so it's really the message that I'm trying to convey. And my objective is simple. Uh, it's important for me that humanity as a whole, you know, our civilization will be guided by the principles of science. You know, that's really important. And therefore, uh, as a practicing scientist, you know, I've published altogether more than 800 scientific papers. And over the past decade, I published more than 500. So I'm, I'm really a practicing scientist. I have a lot of uh, students and, and postdocs working with me. Uh, so I, I think it's important that a scientist, a practicing scientist conveys that and not someone that is popularizing science. So that's a very mm -hmm. important distinction. There are a, a lot of people whose names you know who are quite popular and are discussing science done by others, okay? And that's a different job description. Here I'm talking about myself as a practicing scientist trying to explain to the public why science is exciting and why it can address questions of interest to the public. So you see, the, the, the other issue that drives me is that the scientific community is not really uh, uh, always uh, um, uh, true to its, its mission uh, the definition. Uh, the mission of science is to uh, learn about the world through uh, evidence, through experiments. And the uh, uh, often what you find in academia is people trying to promote their image so that they can get more honors and awards. And sometimes it collides with uh, getting evidence because, you know, if you believe in the multiverse or if you believe in extra dimensions and things that cannot be tested, then you protect yourself against being wrong. And that's a very comfortable spot to be in. It's sort of like asking how many angels can sit on the tip of a pin. That cannot be tested experimentally, and maybe you can make very intelligent, intelligent arguments about it so that you can demonstrate that you are smart and get honors and awards from people that do the same. Uh, so within your club, uh, that by the way, very often feels as if it's on a pedestal relative to the public, you can feel that you are smart, you are respected, and you don't care about what the public cares about. And that I think is a big concern about the current culture in academia that, that uh, academia could work on, on issues or topics that are not of relevance to society, that are not of interest to society, just because there, there is this built-in culture where the values are more about demonstrating that you are smart rather than describing nature as it is. Because if you were to ask what nature is about, you would risk making mistakes. It's a learning experience. You know, Einstein made three mistakes in the last decade of his career because he was really curious about nature. Uh, and so um, my point is, in, in communicating with the public, is also to change the culture, which I think is not healthy right now, where people in academia are not necessarily driven, I mean, in science, I'm not talking about humanities, that's a separate matter. But in science, they're not driven by the ambition to collect as much evidence and discuss only topics that can be tested experimentally. Uh, there, is, there, is, there are whole cultures of people working on things, either conservative items where they just try to refine things we already know, or another community of people that do completely speculative things that cannot be tested, and that's a very safe place to be in. And both communities live in harmony. And I think it's unhealthy because we're supposed to be guided by evidence. We are supposed to be taking risks. And by speaking about it, I'm trying to promote a better reality. Of course, you know, it's not yeah. a pleasant for me to read things on social media that, uh, about, that attack me personally, but it's not about me. You know, you see, I'm trying to promote a better reality that would serve us well. And that includes what we discussed just before, you know, trying to clear up the fog on a subject that the public cares about, sure. scientists dismiss. And I think, you know, once we figure out the nature of UAP, you know, if it ends up being a mundane explanation, we move on. You will be free to discuss other topics that are more important, perhaps, you know, like climate change and things. Uh, but we will know that this subject is over because we realize that these objects all have some explanation that is rather mundane. Let's move on. So I, I think I rather than stay in this status quo where scientists dismiss subjects like that, and the public cares a lot about them, but then there is this, this frozen situation of uncertainty, rather than do that, let's move on. You know, let's, let's be forward looking and, and resolve yeah. these issues. That's great, yeah. And 
uh, one last question I just want to kind of cover a little a little bit is uh, kind of what would be the kind of the proof of concept of of getting the, the project moving, uh, especially in regards to getting images of things. Because right. you know, a big a big issue that you have is the atmosphere. And for me, like the atmosphere is the limiting factor. If I take a picture of something horizontally that is five miles away, I just usually get a blurry mess, regardless of how big of a telescope I get. Definitely. So could you do something just as a proof of concept, like send a drone up and uh, like a few miles away at 20,000 feet or something? You have to get special yeah, permission, that's an I guess. An excellent point. And in fact, we were discussing this. Uh, so the, uh, first we need to select the instruments based on the cost mm -hmm. and the effectiveness, you know, just doing uh, optimal uh, system uh, design. And uh, once we select the instruments, we buy them off the shelf, you know, given the budget, I'm sure that we can buy at least uh, a few systems. Okay. And then indeed, as you say, we need to test them that they are performing. And one way to test them is to fly drones and see that they identify them or um, look at birds and see that they yeah. can, uh, identify them and, and see airplanes. Yeah, definitely. The testing is a crucial component. And I think in the coming months, you know, once we converge on systems that we would like to use, in the coming months, we will be engaged in the testing phase, exactly along the lines okay. that you said. And once we have a working system that is satisfactory, then we can produce copies of it as much as our budget allows and then distribute them in various locations, collect the data, make it available to everyone. You will be able to look at the data and the analysis that we will do will be transparent so you can you know, study it and, and decide if you agree with it. Uh, and it's you know, all part of the standard uh, scientific practice. That's what we would yeah. try to normalize you know, the engagement uh, that uh, people have with this subject normalize by by normalize i mean make it open transparent and uh, and base it on, on on better data that's all and that's the way science operates you know we yeah. don't know what the dark matter is we've been doing it for four decades we haven't found the answer uh, i say that within the mainstream we have situations that are much worse than uh you know we invested the hundreds of millions we didn't find anything so why not do a little bit of, I'm, I'm talking about tens of millions, right? To clear up the fog on this subject. Yeah, but I, I, you say clear up. I really think that's a very ambitious goal uh, because if you don't find something over, say, the next 10 years and oh, we we'll definitely you a find thousand things, stations. Like we, know, we know that birds exist, right? We know that. Yeah, well, sure, exist. sure. But you find something special. I mean, like, yeah, well, does, does that prove anything, that nothing special exists? If we don't if find, find anything, anything special, if we don't find anything unusual, that's an important conclusion. We just say, yeah, uh, the UAP are all conventional things, you know. Or That's perhaps they all know where your telescopes are and they're hiding from your telescopes. <laughs> well, okay. So I, as I said before, we will engage only in the laws of physics. You know, we just use known physics, and we will not engage in any conspiracies here. I mean. Sure. Uh, that's the way science is done, you know. Um, we don't uh, imagine things, you know, uh, ghosts or whatever. We don't say that they're trying. Of course, you can say that they try to avoid the, the, the telescopes we use. But, you know, we could put the telescopes in places that we do, do not disclose ahead of time, right? And, yeah. and we will just do our job. Yeah, that sounds great. I, mean, I look forward to, to what comes out of this. I think it's, it's a very interesting project. And uh, yeah, because I have been stymied so much by the lack of good photographs. And it's very frustrating when people tell you, you know, I saw a UFO and they give you their iPhone photograph and it's a little white dot. Or, I think so, we, come uh, from the I same, uh, we come from the same point of view. And, uh, you know, the science that I do stems from my childhood. Uh, basically, when I was a kid, you know, I wouldn't listen listen to what adults tell me, I would like to figure it out myself. And that's the way kids operate. And <laughs> yep. they learn new things that the adults are not aware of this way. And uh, you know, it's unfortunate that uh, when kids become adult, they lo lose most of the time their sense of curiosity and they start to argue for things that they don't have good evidence for. They, they're trying to pretend that they know more than they actually know. And I could say that throughout my life, I was fortunate enough to maintain my innocence and childhood curiosity. And what you see in front of you is the same farm boy that, that uh, was born 59 years ago. Uh, you know, people that know me from my childhood would, would tell you that I haven't changed much. Yeah.
That's great. And uh, I, I love that sense of uh, adventurism within science is, is great because I think it's something that we do need. We can't just be uh, you know, sticking with Why should boundaries? science be That's... boring? You know, science could be exciting. It shouldn't Indeed. be boring. Indeed. And- Yeah, you yeah. know, even if we end up finding a boring answer, that's part of science. You know, that And when we don't know the answer to something, we should say we don't know. Adults often invent stories. You know, when they don't know something, they invent. That's not necessary. You know, you just say what you know. And when you collect evidence that doesn't show anything unusual, you just say it. I mean, that's fine. Well, I'd like to thank you very much for this discussion. It's been very, very interesting, and I, I wish you well with your project, and I'm definitely going to be following it closely and uh, look forward to your, your first proof of concept photographs. That's going to be very thank interesting. You, and, and, and if you do have that million, of do- million dollars that you mentioned, uh, we would appreciate I'll think it. about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Avi, thank you very much. Bye-bye.